All right, what up, kids? What up, teens? Glad you're back. Hey, please share this. It's our final day. It's our final study. We are uh, we're coming to an end here, the last opportunity of May. And I just want you to, I want to thank you. Some of you have hung with us for months now. I'm excited for you to keep studying God's Word. That's what I want you to think about. Keep studying God's Word. Keep digging into what God says, keep being a follower of Jesus, whether I tune in on Facebook or, or on YouTube or not. All right. And, uh, specifically, I'll just say, um, I will try to, to get on here occasionally and bring some teaching, but I hope that you will run forward with studying your Bible. Hope that you will run forward with trying to build habits of being in God's word, hearing from God, talk with God, um, and, and make your discipleship in following the Lord Jesus your own personal project, depending on him, is your responsibility. And I know you'll have tons of circumstances that make it challenging. Maybe your family's not on board in the same way you are. But you need to embrace the opportunity to know God's word, to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. All right? So that's my charge from the last day. Keep going. Keep going. I wanted to give you one last example of, uh, of, of how we should be running after righteousness. Jesus calls us to greater righteousness, the fear of the Lord. And I think that this command uh, in the Sermon on the Mount is actually a great illustration of the general posture and pick of a Christian's life in seeking to live wisely and lovingly and seeking to live righteously. And so I want to read it for you and just spend a minute here. Uh, Matthew chapter 5, 21. I'm going to read uh, verses 21 and 22 for now. It says, You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, You shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you, anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who, see, who says to a brother or sister, raka, is answerable to the courts. Raka is, is a term for, for like talking down to someone or, or, you know, you don't like them. They're answerable to the courts. Anyone who says you fool will be in danger of the fire of hell. Now, this is where, okay, we've talked about the, the legalism and, and, and license paradigm where sometimes we try, you know, we become a Christian here, and over the course of our lives, we might try to take this line, which is sinfulness and God's holiness, right? Holy and sin. And we might try to lower the line, right? So I'm going to draw it in a different color right now. We might try to lower the line of God's holiness by making it only a certain command that we can attain to, right? Let's say, let's say our law or a law that we can, that we can attain to. Okay. And we find that even that is out of reach, right? But we also try to draw more attainable lines in order to say like, oh, our sin doesn't go too deep. And so I would say our, um, you know, we would call a lot of things I, I'm not sure how to. I'm not sure how to necessarily label this one, but we cover for or we excuse sin. We don't want to look at it. Maybe sometimes we'd even call it our freedom. And all we're really doing, okay, all we're really doing is missing the beauty of what what Jesus has done. Because when we when we try to make this smaller, we we're we're feeling this pressure to say, well, I only needed this much of Jesus. I only needed this much of Jesus, right? Well, what, what's actually true? If we see God's holiness for how high and beautiful it is, if we see our sin for how deep and how dark it goes, what will we do? We won't be turned away. We won't be rejected. In fact, what we'll see is that Jesus was a sufficient Savior, right? That Jesus was a full, satisfactory Savior. Now, sometimes over the course of our life, we will feel this way, and then we'll get back into habits of shrinking the cross again. And, and saying, well, no, my effort, 
or my covering of this is good enough so that then we don't have a need for as big a savior. Okay, so now let's think about our passage specifically. You've heard it was said, let's read it again. You've heard it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder, okay? You shall not murder, and anyone who's subject to murder will be subject to judgment. Now, I don't think that it's unfair to say, okay, look, Jesus is saying the law that was a boundary for the people of Israel was this. Do not murder. Right? That's a high, it's a high standard, but you know what? I haven't murdered anybody. I'm a pretty good guy then, right? You haven't, I hope, murdered anybody. So you must be a pretty decent guy or girl, right? And, and here's the thing. This threshold is a real declaration of a guide towards uh, what God commands us to do. But it's not high enough to sum up and capture all of God's holiness. What does Jesus do? He says, but I tell you, anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. He raises the bar. Now, the reason I've drawn it this way is because he actually doesn't, he doesn't raise God's holiness. You see, God's holiness was always far higher, came out weird, far higher than this specific command, right? It was always high and lifted up. God was always out of reach. So now Jesus in his, um, I would say, uh, in his, his command here, do not be angry. Here's what he's doing. Is he setting a new righteousness that you can attain to? No, he's just, but he is putting one that's far higher than you've been used to so that you might come to the right conclusion. I need a savior. The holiness of God is far higher than just not being angry either. Not even the heart inclinations of, oh, I don't like that guy, or what a dirt bag, or I, you know, in traffic, I'm going to do this. It's higher than that still, but he's trying to show us that what was happening. These commands were signposts to the holiness of God, which, re which is far higher than we ever imagined. And what's that mean, guys? That instead of a bunch of us saying, oh, you know what? I haven't murdered. So good. Murder free. I didn't murder anybody. Well, all of a sudden, you know, everybody below me, they're bad, but I'm good. Well, what if he says, oh, no, wait a second, anger. Anger is punishable by hellfire. All of a sudden, a bunch of us go, uh-oh, I think I've done that. In fact, I've done that a lot in many places. And so what's happening is driving us to see the full darkness and full depth of our sin. And that's why Jesus is saying, hey, I didn't come to uproot the Old Testament. I didn't come to uproot the law. I came to cause it to bear fruit. Because when we call, look at this, and we say, wow, my sin is far deeper and darker than I realized. God's holiness is higher and more pure than I could ever imagine. All we're going to do is exactly what the law wanted us to do, to worship God's character to, to, and to call out in need of a Savior, to drive us to our own inability to bring ourselves to God. So we see our sin exposed and we call out for a Savior, and then we actually find, what do we find? In Jesus, no matter how high, okay, I'm going to put him out here. In Jesus, no matter how high God's holiness goes or sin goes into our lives, what do we actually have? Covering and righteousness. Righteousness that goes all the way up, covering that goes all the way down. You see that? Man, I'm pumped about this. Like, honestly, this makes me 
thrilled because this is the joy of the Christian life. This is the footing that you have to look at God's word. And teens, if you look at God's commands and you're constantly running to, to try and figure out how they can be attainable so that you're not that bad and you can depend on your own strength or say, hey, I've done better than somebody else, you will have a unwise and miserable existence. But if you look and you say, I'm sure God is holy than this is showing me, God show me more. I'm sure there's more places where I'm not exactly like Christ. God show me more ground that I can churn up for the Lord by the Spirit, by depending on Jesus. Because yeah, I know he's got righteousness as high as the heavens and I know he's got covering for all of my sins and I can walk in the joy of Christ. And this is why whether you've been a Christian for one day or for a thousand days or for 10,000 days, I don't know how long 10,000 days is, but for a long time, right? What's going to happen is you are going to always see Jesus as bigger and better and his cross as central to who you are. You're never going to get to a point where, you, you know, you might get to a point here where you say, you know what? I'm a godly enough Christian that I think I maybe did this, at least with anger. Or I, I don't, I've got the rest covered, Jesus. I haven't really been sinfully angry. I haven't murdered anybody. In fact, a lot of these commands, I'm pretty good. All these I've kept since I was a boy, that, yeah, that rich young ruler said, right? There are a lot of Christians who think, you know what? The goal of, of Christian maturity is that eventually I, don't, I, I live in a way that doesn't really need a Savior. When Jesus was a human, is, he is a human currently, but when he lived on the earth, he described full dependence on the Father as the goal. I don't do anything that the Father doesn't want me to do. I don't do anything apart from the Father. Well, here's where we need to be, okay? We need to be saying, my goal is utter, total dependence on Jesus. Uh, nothing, okay? That's what this is right here. Nothing can be done apart from Jesus. Christian maturity and wisdom in your life is going to be you learning to go, to lean into what Jesus has done more and more, to love who Jesus is more and more, to delight in what he's done for you, not what you can do more and more. Apart from me, you can do nothing, he says in John 15. Abide in me. That's what I want you teens to do. I want you to think, hey, this is where I'm headed to seeing Jesus as a bigger and better Savior every day, to loving him and enjoying him, turning away from anything that's against him and embracing how he has given me his righteousness and covered my sinfulness. I want to grow in dependence, not, not become independent. I want to grow in depending on Jesus. That's the goal of my maturity. That's the goal of my Christian life, that I would depend on God by his spirit, depend on Jesus in everything. Teens, I love you. Thankful for you. Hope this makes sense. I'd love to hear from you.